Welcome to the Fence and Deck Mastery Podcast, where we discuss cutting edge techniques, industry trends, and business insights to take your fence or deck company to the next level and dominate your competition. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Fence and Deck Mastery Podcast. I am your host, Alex Danner, and I'm also the founder of Fence and Deck Marketers, which is a digital marketing agency that works exclusive with fencing and decking businesses. If you've seen the shows before, you know, pretty much exclusively lately, I've been trying to bring on new guests, you know, exciting people within the industry that can, you know, really tell their story and offer any kind of insights or value to um, the listeners and anybody that's listening here. Uh, Today, I'm doing the same thing. I have a really exciting guest for you. Um, It's actually one of our brand new clients at Fence and Neck Marketers, and um, just really excited to share his story. I have Santo Pernicano. Uh, from Liberty Fence and Supply, which is a $12 million a year uh, fence company. And they're actually spread out into multiple locations, which is really cool. And I'm excited to to talk about that too. Uh, They're actually in Texas, Arizona, and Oklahoma. And uh, the business itself has been um, been in business since 2002. Santo is going to tell his story kind of when he came in and um, the new ownership and things like that. Uh, But Santo, thank you very much for coming on the podcast with me. Um, how are you doing? How are you feeling today? Doing great, Alex. Yeah. Good. Ready to Good. ready to chat for a little yeah. bit. Yep, yep, absolutely. I'm excited too. And um for a little backstory of Liberty Fence, I, d- I did mention it's a it's a new client. So um I'm excited to show uh Santo everything with digital marketing. It's only been about a month. So we're still building the website and we're gonna be implementing SEO, Google ads, Facebook ads. Well, a lot of this we've already implemented, but um, social media, all kinds of stuff. But we'll talk on the marketing side um, a little bit later. And for now, I just kind of want to give everyone, you know, a little bit of a background on Santo and Liberty Fence. So, uh, Santo, if you wouldn't mind, just kind of tell me a little bit about your story, you know, kind of your history in the fencing industry, your role with Liberty Fence, you know, how you got started with them, you know, anything like that would be great. Sure, sure. So, uh, you know, I've been in the industry almost 40 years now. So I started as a real young guy with uh, back in the day with American Fence out of Arizona. And then after about 17 years with them, went into business for myself in California. Then and all that was on the contracting side, then switched to the um, the vendor side Uh with Master Halco, Stevens Pipe and Steel. Uh, did some of that with them in Texas and the East Coast, and then um, moved back to Arizona, joined Liberty Fence about almost five years ago. So I've been on the contracting side and, and the vendor side. Uh, past president of the American Fence Association, that's been a, uh, a real important part of my career in the industry. Uh, so I'm very, very proud of that service and time. And so that's given me a chance to have friends all across the uh, United States from East Coast to West Coast. But now we're in the middle. So yeah. I live in Oklahoma and and GM for uh, Liberty Fence. That's gotcha. the short, short version. Yeah, you. I don't know how that never came up. I had no idea you were the president or the former president of the, you said the AFA? Yes, sir. American oh, wow. Fence Association. Yes. Yeah, learn something new every day. When um when did you serve as a president? So that my year was uh 2013. Uh okay. that they do a one year stint, but you know, oh, the service that? through all of that is is over many years. You have, you know, on the board and uh yeah, different roles throughout the time, but that's the highlight. So very cool. And then you chair Fence Tech, you know, as well. So uh been to many fence techs, our, our big industry show. Yeah. Yeah. As well. Okay. Um, yeah, that's awesome. I, I had, uh, I had no idea you're, you're being too modest. You didn't, you didn't tell me, um, tell me that when we first spoke, that's really cool. Uh, sure. okay. So if you could just kind of a little bit about Liberty fence and supply, um, tell us just kind of a little bit when the business originally got started, um, Approximate revenue, you know, number of trucks, employees, you know, really anything about the business will be great. Sure. So Liberty Fence started in 2002. And uh, I don't know a lot of the history 
over those years, but it had three owners involved at the time. And they typically did about three to five million a year pretty consistently. Uh, started up in Sholo, Arizona. Um, then a little bit before me, they branched into Tucson, Arizona, and Phoenix. Uh, when I joined the scene, um, Kirby Reinhardt, it, it went through a change of ownership um, a couple of times. But when I joined the team, Kirby Reinhardt, uh, along with the two minority owners, were the owners, uh, like I said, about five years ago. And um, and then he bought them out a couple of years ago. So it's evolved a little bit over time. So Kirby owns the company 100% now. Uh, when I joined, the, like I said, doing about $5 million, uh, we're at that $12 million, headed to 15 in the next year or so. Uh, we've got now, we've progressed from the three locations to seven uh, areas. So that's been a big part of the of the growth. We're primarily a, we lean a little more towards a commercial market, um, probably 70%, maybe 30% residential in one of our uh, markets in Arizona. So that's the. Uh, gotcha. Okay. And yeah, so we've got, so, so yeah. And so I was gonna say, so our, most of our, on our commercial side, I'd say 90%, we use subcontractors for the installation. Okay. Um, so we we like to think of ourselves as more of a uh, sales and project management, what we have the hands on with. And of course we manage the subcontractors, uh, the jobs with them in the field, but that's our preference for the labor side. Of okay. The, of the and, industry. And that's, that's a good point there. I mean, do you have any, trouble finding really good subcontractors i mean you know you guys are installing a lot of fences so i mean you have a i would imagine you have a pretty good vetting system for finding the right types of contractors but um had any issues with that i mean you know hiring um, yeah it, it, it it's our it's our toughest challenge which which is probably not uncommon uh to most fence people i mean whether you have in-house crews or subcontractors in a sense I'm a very optimistic, positive person, but it, it is pick your poison to a degree. Um, and we've just felt that uh, the subcontractor side of things of labor is a better option for us, but it's a challenge. Uh, labor is, as everybody knows, is probably across the country from my friends that I talk to in the industry. It's the yeah. toughest part. Yeah. Yeah, just finding people. I mean, it's it's tough work too. So, um, so you kind of, it is. yeah, I'm I'm kind of curious too. Like with the subcontractors, do you kind of find that they do a good job of you know replacing employees too, or they do a good job of retaining them? I mean, are they consistently having that problem of people leaving? You know, and you know, just high turnover. Um, I know from your perspective, it's got to be nice to not have to worry about that. But I'm just curious if they are just really good at doing that or how it works no uh they i mean some are better <laughs> than others but it, yeah. it it again same problem because it's it's just it is hard work in fence so you know we just have to go through the numbers till we find a good one but i would say generally speaking you know they have a little more incentive than a typical employee because the subcontractors that we attempt to choose are really not just selling their labor. The ones we really try to develop a relationship are the ones that are trying to really run a business, but just simply enjoy the operational labor side of things. So that's that's a tough one to, you know, but that's what we strive for. When we find that type, we, we try to make sure we do our part and treat them well. Uh, you know, they demand a little higher pay but the incentives are there. You yeah. Know, we tend to negotiate a flat rate for the job and, and they do their thing and we want them to be successful, obviously. Yeah. Cause that helps us. Yeah. And so would There's you say magical? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm curious, like, would you say when you, you know, you've expanded into these different markets, did you find when you go into a new market? Well, 
take a step back, do you go into a new market after you already kind of know you have those connections with subcontractors or do you go based off of the market itself and then, you know, you have a system to find these subcontractors? Yeah, that's a good question. I wouldn't say that we have a perfect system, but, you know, we'll typically start remotely with the most important thing is finding the person that will be our branch manager to start or our project manager salesperson. And then um, we start bidding work right away, typically, because your commercial work, you get a contract today, you don't start it for a month or two. So that that's somewhat typical. And then, you know, we put ads in and then word of mouth and we'll ask, you know, vendors and suppliers if they have any recommendations and then we begin our process to interview them meet with the sub so we do a little bit of that up front but our main focus is sell it and then we figure out and as we're expanding we're not really super concerned because now as you as we're going you know if we have to pull in a sub from one of our other markets you know we, we don't panic over the fact yeah. that we're not going to be able to get it done we'll pull yeah. it in someone can come in there and fix it if they have to. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Okay. Um, so the, I'm, I'm very curious about the supply side because I don't, I think we've done one podcast episode with somebody that supplied, well, actually it was decking. So it's completely different. Um, but I'm curious because most, um, obviously there's a lot more contractors and suppliers. So since you're doing both, I think it'd be interesting for everyone to kind of know, why you got into the supply side, you know, kind of how that happened. Did you start in s supply? It sounds like you didn't, but, um, you know, just, I guess how you got into that and how you feel about it, you know, do you like it to work out pretty well or no? Yeah, I think it's underrated. Now on our supply side, it's not, we're not like a regional supplier, like your typical, you know, it's more, uh, to the public. We do sell to, let's say smaller, uh, fence contractors, it's primarily in uh, two of our locations. So we're starting to sell material sales in Oklahoma at our store there. Because you really, I mean, obviously you have to have a storefront, a little bit of inventory. Up in our Lakeside branch, you know, they have quite a bit of inventory because we have we have a five acre facility there. So, and we're on a main street. So we have a lot of walk-in traffic. Um, but it's, material sales, I think is kind of underrated. I think to our fault, we're looking at doing more of that just for the simple diversification is a good thing. Um, but so for us, it's mostly the, uh, you know, the walk-in public traffic. So, right. which you're going to help us with, with our marketing <laughs> to get more people in the door. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, it's whenever I hear about the supply side, I always think about that story of the gold rush where they said, you know, the people that went all crazy about the gold rush and bought all those tools and went to like, look for gold. Those guys were not anywhere close to as smart as the guys that sold the shovels. <laughs> so I, I'm thinking right. about the guys, you know, the suppliers, I think about that way. Cause I mean, if you're in a good market, you're always going to be, if you have good connections, obviously it's not just like automatic, but if you have a lot of good connections and a lot of guys coming to you, then no matter who gets the jobs, you know, <laughs> you're not bidding as much and no matter who gets it, hopefully they're coming to you to, get the supplies um i don't yeah, know yeah and we do we do it. get some of that yeah okay. we bid a few jobs where we didn't get the job and yes and then the uh contractor came and bought the supplies but really that's not our <laughs> it, it has it does happen so it's nice it does. yeah it makes you feel a little better <laughs> so you get some you don't get it all but you get some so. yeah 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 okay um, so with the locations that you have, so you're in Texas, Arizona, and Oklahoma, it, did, right. it started in Arizona, correct? It did. So Sholo, Arizona pretty much was yeah. where, uh, Liberty Fence started and then it expanded to Phoenix and Tucson. And then we started San Antonio about three years ago. Then we kind of progressed up the 35 corridor to, uh, Austin, Dallas most recently, and then Oklahoma about a year ago. Gotcha. Okay. So, um, sorry, you went to Oklahoma first or you went to Texas first? No. So we did San Antonio was our first out okay. of Arizona office. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And any particular reason why you wanted to go there? So we, 
our theory is it's more about the person than the location. I mean, obviously it has, we have to do some research and make sure the market, you know, makes somewhat sense. Um, so we got a tip to the person uh, uh, at the time that we started with and went and, and met that person and started the branch. And then, uh, and then I guess we did feel that Dallas, of course, is a super huge market. So we knew that would be a good spot. But again, it was a referral from an employee that worked with us to somebody that might want to make a change. And uh, we decided that was a good person. And we obviously knew the market was huge and we went there. So our focus is more find the person and then the market market part is secondary. Okay. The person. And when you say person, you mean like you have a the manager of that? Or are you talking like a subcontractor crew? No, on the sales side, the sales, sales slash side. project okay. manager, the person that can, you know, ultimately that we feel can sell fence, basically. Gotcha. And or run a branch, you know, with okay. our model. So Okay. Um so it, okay. it it enables us to go into a market, you know, yeah. with one person to start, in essence. So. Okay. Well, how, how would you say, um, in terms of managing those locations, you told me that you, you, know, you got the family in the RV and went down there. So got a little bit of an insight into, you know, how you manage the locations, but I guess day to day, I mean, how do you keep tabs on all the, you know, these guys? I mean, um, you ever have any issues with them? I mean, how does that typically work out? Yeah. Again, nothing, no magical wand. It's still, <laughs> no matter what you do, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's about the person. So, we really we're pretty solid with we think you know the overall uh, pay structure and plan that we have for starting our project managers and managers is a is a good fair we think above average uh, opportunity so we get that person in and yeah we have weekly reporting weekly sales meetings we have all the reports that you know we feel are necessary to look at numbers. Um, and I'm on the phone a lot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, half, half my day, you know, is on the phone. Uh, but again, it's about the person is, yeah. is the key. So I'm assuming you would look for someone that has actual fence sales experience, has been in the industry for a little while before you're saying, like, let's open up a branch for them. Absolutely. They need to have some fence experience. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, we're in the process right now of looking for a business development person. And uh, so that can, is going to be more construction in general, but for those starting those locations, yeah, it's definitely fence industry experience would be a requirement. Okay. Do you typically see how much experience they have? I mean, is there ever like minimums that they need to have within the industry? Not really. No. Okay. I mean, at, at least a cut. They they have to be able to read a set of plans because we're more commercial oriented. So, yeah. Uh, gotcha. Understand, you know, how to do that, and from that standpoint, the rest we have the system in place to support them administratively and all all the things necessary for that piece. So. Gotcha. So, I like the invoicing and stuff you guys handle. It's really just about the sales that they okay, and obviously yeah. changing the jobs okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so since Santo joined about five years ago, as he was saying, the business has tripled. So obviously some good things have been happening since. Um, you touched on a couple of things you've done differently since starting, but what would you say maybe top three? I mean, the top thing that really propelled that growth, you know, really helped you, you know, get to the, you know, triple the revenue within such a short time. I'm sorry, Alex. I didn't. What was the question? Oh, did it what, break what up? What were the things? Sorry, I did break up a little bit. Um, yeah. So the within so five years ago, that's when you joined the company and the business tripled. Right. What would you say the top thing or maybe the top three things that really propelled that growth? You know, really helped you jump, make that jump. So, I would think the main thing is you have to have ownership, has to be, have a vision and a plan. So Kirby, you know, that I mentioned owns a company hundred percent mm -hmm. now. Uh, he's very driven, very sales oriented, wants to win, loves 
loves, you know, playing and, and growing and, and I mean, playing the game and in yeah. a sense of uh, we like to win. So he had that, he has that spirit and that vision. So you have to have that. If you don't have that, nothing else matters. Then I would say the next thing is, you know, we develop together a plan. We talk about it every day. We review it, you know, on a regimented every quarter. So we have our measurements. Uh, so we have a model and a, and a plan in place. And then we actually, you know, we execute it. Um, so growing into the new markets, obviously just kind of common sense that has enabled us to find those people. But again, it's willingness of ownership to invest and you have to want to grow for some, whatever your motivation and reason is as an owner. So. Uh, once I had that part, my part is more implementation. And so it's vision. I think vision and planning and again, nothing magical yeah. in a sense, but. Well, I think you're being pretty modest. There, I'm sure you implemented a lot uh, of things. Well, there's really... not, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, my strength is more uh, administrative and operational, you know, getting people in the right positions in the right place. It's still, I love working with people. So I like training and, you know, and so we have all those things in place. And I spend a lot of time uh, developing relationships because if people don't, the, the main reason people leave is because they don't like their boss. Yeah. And it's, you know, uh, so it's important for your people to know that you're behind them. You want their success. You have to demonstrate, I think, those things. But again, it's all, it's people. If you are sincere about, you can have all the vision and strategy, but if you just want to use people for numbers, um, we try to be very sensitive and careful uh, that we don't do that. So yeah, yeah. I mean, that's kind just, of yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, so I guess like the company culture, you guys focus on that as well, pretty good amount. You know, making sure everyone's you know happy and there's growth opportunities, that kind of thing. We do. We believe our structure that we have is really fair. But yet, at the same time, I can say we believe that we have so much more to work on. It's kind of like the bigger you get, the more you have to to work on. Yeah, because uh, you can lose sight of something and, you know, real easy as you pick up the pace and you're growing. So we're going to engage a person to come in and help us with that this year. Nice. Make sure that our culture is that we're doing all the, the best things that we can. So yeah. again, that's ownership willing to invest in in doing you know the right thing along the way. Yeah. So. so I don't think it's technically, I mean, not like a franchise, but it's almost kind of similar to that model. So, you know, I guess a little bit. Um, yeah, we, we try to, uh, with our branch managers, our program is kind of like, you know, you have Alex Inc. within Liberty Fence. So in a sense, yes but not officially yeah. a franchise, but yeah. Okay. Do they, much. do you set them up in a way, you know, you have like systems that they have to follow, like when they first sign up and they start a branch, do they get like resources to be like, this is how we do it. This is how our company runs. Um, are you guys pretty strict in that regard or how's that work? We do, you know, we we use the same uh, CRM. We use the same documentation. All of our forms are, are, pretty much the same, but yet we have the flexibility for them to our expectation is they come in and we help them, but they learn their market and you have to sell fence to the market that you're in. So there's flexibility, but yeah, we're standard operating procedures on all of our things. And we support all the administrative piece. It's there. Yeah. So it's already exists. We have our supplier relationships that already exist. So, you know, we can expand in any market all that stuff is done. The insurance is in place. So yeah, in a sense, you could say it's, it's a bit like franchising. Gotcha. In okay. A way. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious on the, on the sales side, you know, when somebody, well, this could be, you know, within the branches that, you know, in Arizona, the original ones too. I'm just curious if it kind of also extends to the new, the new locations, but do you have any kind of unique sales positions that you use? Anything that like really stands out when you're trying to make a sale that, you know, 
sometimes can put you above the rest, I guess. Um, well, I mean, we think there's a lot of things, but, but again, I think using, you know, this, the whole digital marketing, which is new to us, there, no matter how much you do of that, I mean, that's a good thing, right? It, it gets people more in front of us, but nothing replaces the face-to-face -face going and meeting somebody. Again, most of our things are with a general contractor, most of our customers. So, you know, I don't believe you can replace if you're the general contractor, me as a salesperson, developing that relationship with you so that ultimately over time, you know that Santo's going to take care of you and he's going to see that the job gets done. You don't, you care about price always, but within reason, you're not hyper-focused on that. You just know that Liberty Fence and Santa, they're going to take care of the job. And so that's what we sell more than anything. That's why it's so important for that person to be, you know, have integrity, have the ability to get in front of a person face to face and have comfortability there. Um, we know we give the support on the backside. So that's what we push to sell is I want to be your fence guy. I, when you think fence, I don't want to give you any reason to think anybody else but me. Yeah. And if I do that, then, you know, the rest is just repeat business. Yeah. So that's, that's, it's again, nothing magical. And that's hard to do all the pieces that are comprise that, but that's where, you know, Kirby and I really spend time with our people to keep them focused on that. Yeah. Um, and I, I would imagine that really helps on the commercial side when people are submitting bids and you know people get to talk and if you have a good relationship with them, they're always going to think of you to you know try to bid on the project. Yeah, that's where some of your systems do come in. I mean, you need to be responsive, right? Be timely, uh, not be late. Uh, yeah. So be all those things that make their job easier. Yeah. Okay. Um, so any kind of sales recommendations, just, you know, stay on the sales side a little bit, any kind of sales recommendations, things you would recommend to any fence guys that are listening, um, you know, to really help, I guess, close more deals or, you know, convert more customers? Well, you have to have product knowledge. So one of the things that we, we sometimes see that I've seen over the years, ultimately at the end of the day, if we hire Alex, we expect Alex to do his homework and keep learning, keep training, be an expert so that when you go out to somebody's, whether it's residential or commercial, that you have that product knowledge and that expert ability to give recommendations, do value engineering, give suggestions, all those kind of things. So I would say product knowledge is, is extremely important. Um, and then the commitment to at least how I like to think that I try to do my best is I just want you to have the confidence to know that even if there's a problem, Santo is my main person. I don't have to call anybody else. I don't have to go above his head in the company. He's going to fix my issue. Yeah. Uh, so how do you as a fence person become the fence guy for your client, your customer? So you get that repeat business. That's the advice I would give. And so sometimes that takes a little bit of thought. What yeah. things do I need to do to improve? What help do I need? How do I do that? How do I get to that level where you think of me as your fence guy i like that a lot that's really good so what would you say i mean to become the well i have a couple of questions a couple of things spinning in my head now um the first one would be you know i'm i'm assuming to become that fence guy where someone's always whenever someone thinks fence they think of you does that mean you want them to be like constantly calling you, I guess, emailing you, like whenever they have a problem, um, I would assume they're coming to you to ask you different questions about things. And that's kind of, uh, you know, how you build that reputation by fixing those little problems that they have, you know, over time. 
so yeah, I mean, not to repeat, but it, yeah, it's all those things. I mean, yeah. when I think about when I was more involved myself personally in sales, uh, my good customers, they wouldn't think of calling anybody. Yeah. They just didn't because I didn't, I tried to be very careful and not give them any reason. And it's tough, right? It, it could be a product knowledge. It could be just getting back to them timely. It could be showing up to the job site, going that, whatever that it took to, for them just to know he's got it. Yeah. They never doubted. They never doubted that I wouldn't take care of it. Yeah. That's interesting. I like that. Cause it, it reminds me of um, a situation. I have uh, a friend, you know, they own some car dealerships and they live, I mean, I keep moving North in Maryland and they're at the very bottom of Southern Maryland. So it's, it took us like, two and a half hours to get our most recent car from them. But um, because he's the one that answers my texts, you know, he gets back to me, even though he's the head of the dealership and I'm, I feel bad because I'm sure he's responding to a lot of people. And unfortunately, you know, I'm working during the day, I'm busy. So it's after hours, <laughs> um, you know, when I'm texting him and like I said, I feel bad about it, but sometimes that's the only time I can really figure it out. And, you know, he always texts me back and, you know, for that reason, I keep driving two and a half hours to a Chevy dealership because that's what I like versus, you know, the one that's right down the street. And I think that is kind of what you're saying, right? With the fencing side, you're always just that point of contact. Yeah. It, you know, if, if at any point you make, in my opinion, you make a customer feel like they're an interruption to your day, or to your process, that's death to a salesperson. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so even though you may not intend to do that, those are the little things. Like I say, you, you have to be on guard of all of that. You, they may be an interruption to your most pressing thing at the moment, but if they sense that from you, now, now you just opened something that eh, you created some doubt in their mind. So. Hard to do, right? But that's yeah. what I was always try to be conscious of. Yeah, yeah. With and my that, customers. Yep, that little doubt is in their head now. And if somebody comes up, that's a little bit more convenient to deal with. And you know, then they could switch over. Yeah, and yeah. The business. Yeah. So uh, that was really good. I like I like that a lot. So the okay. So of course, I got to talk a little bit about marketing. And you know, we're working together on the the digital side, but. Um, I believe I've asked you these questions before, but I'm trying to jog my memory here. But did you do any offline marketing at all since you've uh, worked with Liberty Fence? You know, any direct mailers, like billboards, um, print, you know, any kind of signs, things like that? So we've done a variety of things. We use fence signs, but again, um, in all fairness, our most of ours is commercial and with general contractors and things. But in the market that we do, do residential and we'd like to get more into residential. Um, hence why we engage our, our <laughs> program more with you. Uh, we've, so we've done little tidbits, but that's not our expertise. So we're smart enough to know, you know, we're, we're over our head here on the digital marketing side. And honestly, that's why we've reached out to you. We did do a little radio um, advertising in our show low market. Now that was a local, very niche market, uh, kind of a uh, a small, I would say a smaller community. Um, but we're very so we're but we're yet we're spread out because it's just the nature of the market up there. Uh, so we've done some of that. We've dibbled and dabbled at it, and so we feel that if you can help us bring people into our view, that then our salespeople are really strong so when they make that appointment you know their closing ratio with people we know will be high but we're not an expert at getting more people into the door so yeah yeah and, and the residential side oh we'll touch on here in a second um i guess i, I was just curious on the commercial side um so there's nothing really i mean you can do digital marketing for that but there's nothing that is kind of known as the main thing to help with commercial. It's more just like you have to do a good job and build relationships, you know, in person and kind of nurture those relationships. It's more of that. Yeah. Yeah. And and you have to have the ability to be a 
pre-qualified. So you have to have the resources as a company to otherwise the general contractor is, you know, they won't consider you. So you do have to have your ducks in a row and be certain size and capabilities and show that with documentation. So we've done some, but again, it's mostly calling on them and most of them will say, okay, you need to get pre-qualified with us. And we go through that process to do that. Gotcha. Okay. And then that's pretty typical. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And with the the networking, because you, you mentioned you're the president of the AFA, did you think that joining groups like that or, and maybe some other ones that you've joined, uh, did you see that had a big you know impact in terms of you know? Anything? So for me personally, uh, me personally in my career in fencing, joining the American Fence Association was by far the number one most important thing that I ever did for my oh, fence wow. career. Wow, nice. Uh, and and. And I say that because, you know, if somebody's new and they haven't joined or they haven't been involved, to me, I began to understand, you know, this is my industry. This is where, this, the, you know, so I need to invest in it. I need to give back to it. I need to learn from it. Uh, I met, like I said, friends and people that shared ideas, concepts. Uh, business-wise, field side, operationally, administratively. I mean, I could go on and on. I learned so much from my peers um, in the industry by doing that and exposing me to the relationships that certainly helped my career. So by far. Okay. Okay. And then was it, did you join any others besides AFA? We, we currently, our company currently, uh, are members of the American or the AGC Associated General Contractors because okay. that's where a lot of our customers are. So, uh, you know, they have their networking events where they are. And so we do, but again, and in, in, in my past, I also was the president of the American Subcontractors Association of California for a stint when I was there. But the point of that more is, is that you've, Unless you get involved, you can just join an association, whether it's AFA or AGC. You have to commit, and that's the tough part, committing to the meetings, committing to yep. being on the board. Again, if you're a vision and you want to grow your company, I don't see how you do it without joining associations yeah. Yeah. and being a part of something bigger than you. Yeah, uh, That's just my personal opinion. Yeah, and just the amount of time it saves you. I mean... I'm part of masterminds, you know, where I pay to be part of groups and learn from other, from other agency owners. And, um, I think about it quite often, the amount of time I've just saved by not having to make, you know, there's always going to be learning mistakes where you do things the hard way. That's kind of inevitable, but the amount of things that I've been able to like skip over because I heard of someone that already had that problem and found the better way. I mean, it's unbelievable. And I can't even imagine how much longer things would take if you weren't you know, learning from other people. So I think, yeah, I think when you think you're, you're it and you're the biggest thing, <laughs> probably as far as you're going to go, yeah. whatever that is. So always a, always a bigger bear. <laughs> always Absolutely. someone doing bigger things. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So on the digital marketing side, uh, as I said, in the beginning uh, to everyone listening that we're doing building a new website for Liberty Fence and Supply, doing SEO, Facebook ads, uh, local services ads, and um, social media. So since it was mostly commercial, and it, at this point it still is, except for a couple markets, um, as you mentioned, and we're, we're working together on the Oklahoma side, uh, specifically in Arizona too. Um, what made you decide to go, you know, with digital marketing, you know, I guess what happened where you're just like, I think we need to, cause, cause you were doing it. You were doing some of it, you know, you did a little bit of SEO, you know, you had a website. So, uh, but what kind of hit you that, you know, we need to pay closer attention to this and, you know, explore more about it. Well, I think both Kirby and I, in our discussions came to the realization that we're not experts in it. We see other people doing it. We see, you know, and we want to, get into this market better. And so we were just like, it's not our expertise. Um, so we had a website because everybody has a website kind of thing. But, but 
you know, as you began to educate me, we, we kind of knew we had a hunch. And then uh, actually my wife, Laura, found you on Facebook and uh, <laughs> she, she works with us in, in the Oklahoma office and uh, she came across you and, you know, we got connected and Kirby and I had been talking about, you know, we've got to hire a professional company that can put this program together for us because, you know, we don't have the time. Yeah, yeah. And, and we don't have the expertise. So yeah, honestly, that's as simple as an answer as I can give. <laughs> and so we're excited yeah. that you can be that person for us. So you got to know your weaknesses. And we, we knew that, that we're probably failing in that area. So yeah, fair enough. Here and, we uh, are. Yeah, fair enough. And you guys have already reached a, a level of success where you can, I think a lot of times we talk to, you know, smaller companies and, you know, they got to, you know, you guys have reached some success where you can hire somebody to manage it for you. And, um, that's what makes it a lot easier too. And, uh, the point I meant, I mean by that is if it's a smaller company, it can be a little bit tougher to kind of make that jump or make that investment. Um, but well, it can be, but, but if they're, if they're going to start out, for example, in residential and everything, I mean, I sometimes, right. Because I remember back in my career, there were times when I spent money with consultants or things when when I wasn't a big company either. We weren't, yeah. but you recognize that it's an investment. Yeah, you know, there's a difference. Uh, one of Kirby's big statements that he reminds all of us in our company is that investing is way different. Investing money is way different than spending money. Yep. So, you know, if if it's an investment. I mean, you expect the return and you've done a good job and, you know, I know we're just started with each other, but I like the fact that you're going to help us measure that success. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, and that, there has to be that return, but anyway, that's, uh, yeah. That, and that's a great point. It's something I, I like to touch on. Um, whenever you do any kind of marketing or anything, you know, whenever you're putting your money into, you got to be able to measure it. So, I mean, if you're not, installing the right tracking or you have the right KPIs, you're going to have no idea what you're, you're paying for. Right. I mean, you'll know if you just start running out of money and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't recuperate, but before that you really have no clue. So if anybody's doing digital marketing, that's listening, you know, make sure whether it's you internally or someone else, an agency, they're installing tracking. So tracking everything, because you don't want to just know how much you're spending on marketing and your return. You want to know, how much you're making off every single individual thing you do. So how much Google ads are making you, Facebook ads, SEO. There's ways to track all that with software, like what converts, call rail, high level. And they it's a learning curve, but um, it's worth it because otherwise you have no idea. You're just kind of blindly spending money and you don't know, like, should I put more money here, less money here, you know, whatever, without that tracking piece. So, And that's uh, exactly where where we were. Before yeah. we met you. So, yeah. 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 It's, it's, I mean, when I first got into digital marketing, I didn't know about tracking either. You know, we had to like really get dialed in to like understand, you know, which KPIs are the most important. And at the end of the day, it's leads and, and revenue. So, um, okay. And real quick, have you ever used lead buying companies at all, like Angie's List or Yelp or Thumbtack? We haven't yet, honestly, okay. Alex. We have okay. not. Okay. All right. Um, and I can't remember if, um, do you keep, well, first off, uh, a CRM software, do you, which, which, uh, CRM do you use? So we use true right now. Okay. Okay. T -R -U -E. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you a fan of it? Do you like it? So, uh, I like it because right now, honestly, we never really had any other way to do it. Uh, their accounting side, we tried that and we didn't care for that. So we still use QuickBooks uh, for our accounting. But for the CRM part, keeping track, uh, being able to track our, we're using one of their uh, custom reports that they built for us pretty easily. And uh, so now we're instituting our sales meetings weekly where we can do our follow up. And so that's a, a real clean process because it was a kind of another weakness as we're growing. We realized, gosh, we've got millions of dollars out there in bids and follow-up probably for everybody can realize can be challenging without a, a good CRM system. So 
Yeah. That's yeah. And um, to, I figured I'd mention this and we, we can talk about this later too, but um, I had a meeting with a client that used Service Titan. Have you ever heard of them before? I, I have not. Okay. They're, they're one of the bigger ones. They're kind of well known as like one of the top guys in terms of like construction CRMs. But um, one thing I was checking out and I've seen this before, but Service Titan, I thought did a really good job in terms of linking the leads to the revenue. So we could basically list out, you know, the online uh, marketing and get very granular in terms of every single type of marketing. Um, there's all kinds of variations to each type, but you know, Google ads, Facebook ads, uh, SEO, and then you could tie those leads to see if they actually closed. So it was cool. I was playing around with it in service Titan yesterday and I could see the revenue generated. Um, I could see, you know, where the leads came from, how many calls, and then what revenue that uh, led to as well. So that's kind of one step further. I'll, I'll um, talk to you as well, because if you're interested in something like that, but anyone listening that has that opportunity, I saw it with Service Titan and um, HubSpot too. And I think there's a couple others, but anyway, it's okay. it was pretty Good. fascinating to see that, you know, like the actual revenue numbers that came in too. Yeah, I think we have to be, uh, you know, open-minded. So we, we like to think of ourselves, I mean, we do, we're open-minded to looking at the best and the latest that makes sense out there. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So kind of getting towards the end here, but I'm, I'm curious since all the success that you've seen, you know, Liberty Fence is doing great. I'm excited to help grow onto that um, as we work together more, but what would you say, and I'll uh, backtrack, you were saying that, you know, you guys have that will to win. You like being aggressive course if you don't want to grow you're never going to grow <laughs> so um that makes sense but there's a a lot of hungry people out there a lot of ambitious people so to that person that's starting uh i guess let's say you know maybe they're at 1 million or 2 million and they're trying to really get to that next level i mean is there anything specific you would say to them to you know, really help jump start sure that? obviously have a have a have your vision and then work a plan, make sure you're educated on the uh, cost of doing business, the business side, figure out, spend time in the beginning to figure out what your weaknesses are as you're looking at your vision. Be humble enough to know, you know, I'm we're probably really strong here, but I don't really know over here and go seek experts. And it, you don't have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars. I mean, there's a cost to everything. But you might have to attend some classes. You may have to seek out, uh, you know, partners, whether it be a bonding agent, a good insurance broker, uh, a good attorney uh, that that you can get. And especially on the accounting side, uh, you know, a good accountant. Those key components are very important in growing. You know, if in, in the fence business, if you're going to do and there's nothing wrong with it. Maybe I just want to do a million or two a year. I'll manage it myself with my wife and have a, a crew or two. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you can probably do it. I've found over my years, you start getting over two million and heading to three, four, five. You're going to need the outside uh, help. You, you just are, in my opinion, to be successful and continue on a growing pattern. And... You know, it makes no sense to double your business from one million to two million, and that, and then make the same amount of money. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, you're you're just working harder for the same amount of money. So, you know, you don't you don't want to do that. Yeah. So that's, that's what I would say. That's a good point. Yeah. Make focus on your profit too, and not just you know the revenue that's coming in. I think a lot of Absolutely. people make that mistake. <laughs> um. Okay. And, and we talk about that all the time at our size. There's no sense in doing 15 million, making the same amount of money that we did as 10 million. Why would we do that? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I mean, then the day you're just making your job harder, doing more work and less right. time for the things right. that you probably are working towards anyways. So, right. okay. Any additional, you know, nuggets of wisdom, any insights that you'd like to, to share with, you know, anybody that's listening that has a fence, to, uh, fence company? Um, anything you could share with them before we kind of close out? Yeah, I mean, I think we've touched on it all. Again, good advisors, good plan, good vision. Join the association, yep. whatever might be appropriate for them. Uh, 
it it will open their eyes if they're not members of of any associations those are just good really good things okay so that you're not alone yeah 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 you have some help and people that have been down the road a little bit okay absolutely okay well i think that was all the questions i had um for you santo i appreciate you coming on here i think there was some really really good stuff we went over and honestly it made me take a step back and that's why i asked so many different questions that we didn't um you know haven't really gone over but uh thanks for you know answering all those and you know um you know really just sharing all the all the years you have you know in the fence industry so um going forward with uh, the fence and deck mastery podcast um i'm going to be continuing to do posts like this or uh, sorry episodes like this where um bring on you know whether it's a client or just somebody within the industry anything to really help out uh i think today definitely was a lot of good uh you know good wisdom that santo shared and everyone i'm uh assuming got a ton out of it because i know i did but if you are enjoying these episodes and enjoying the podcast be a huge help if you can leave a review and subscribe to it um, that just helps us get you know more people involved and um podcast isn't going anywhere i want to you know get more and more people on here and share as much as possible to help out the the industry so um and also if you are interested in uh digital marketing or just talking about your marketing for your fence or deck company feel free to reach out you can go to our website everything's on there um and you can also check us out on the on social media we post content there there's a lot of free content we add through the podcast we do monthly webinars social media posts um a whole bunch of stuff where my team and I, you know, spend each week really producing. So uh, that's really all I had for um, podcast today. Santo, appreciate you coming out and uh, join the podcast and um, yeah, have a great rest of the week. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate the time. All right. Take care.